I'd like to introduce the next panel, all about entrepreneurship and elevating women to lead Web3 innovation. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Jennifer Sanasi, uh, host at Coindesk, Ginger Dollywall, David Song, Marta Belcher, and Jen Sol. Welcome. Um, what an incredible morning it's been. The energy in this room is fantastic. I'm Jennifer Sanasi. I host a show every day at noon on Coindesk called The Hash. I also head up marketing for a couple of decentralized autonomous organizations. If you don't know what that is or it sounds confusing, it is also confusing to people in the space. So come and talk to me later if you would like to figure out what I'm uh, talking about. Today we're going to be chatting about elevating women in Web3. So thank Thank you to the last panel for laying the foundation of what is going on in Web3, and we're just going to take that to the next level. So I'd like to introduce my panelists. We have Ginger Dollywall. She's the co-founder and CPO at Upflex. Jen Sule, president at Otherworld Computing. David Song, CEO at Rosie Labs. And Marta Belcher, she is the president at the File Filecoin Foundation and general counsel at Protocol Labs. Now, I'm going to sit down so I don't have so much authority on this stage. It feels strange for me. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to sit down, and let's chat about uh, elevating women. So when I think about elevating women in Web3, I think about tech, right? Women have traditionally been you know, locked out, information isn't as accessible. We really have to fight hard to break the barriers to operate in this world. Ginger, I want to hear a little bit um, from your perspective historically as to why now is the time for women to really make a difference in this space. Thank you, Jennifer. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, fantastic. Um, you know, it, I've had such an incredible experience in my life where I've been part of the journey in technology since 1996. Um, and one of the first things that I learned very quickly was this understanding that you don't need to know it all. And what's very exciting right now is Web3 is so young. <laughs> and anyone that is willing to invest in learning has an opportunity to really transform this industry um, when it comes to technology. I mean. We've gone through so many crises, and how many times do we have to do that to understand that nothing good comes out of having decisions made by only white men? We need to disrupt, and we need to take ownership in building this new uh, transformational platform that we'll have access to. So um, it's so important that women get involved, um, and there's you know inclusion in so many different ways, right? Intentional inclusion in helping to build this new foundation is so important. And uh, what's wonderful about Web3 is the fact that it's decentralized and the entire mission and mandate is to enable everyone to participate. So very excited to be talking about this topic. Yeah, it's, it's transparent, right? So we don't have these few people that are creating these spaces that, it, that can lock people out. We can see what's going on. Um, we can verify. We don't need to trust. David, as our ally on the panel, tell us, how, how can men who work in tech, who work in Web3, help make this possible? Because it's not only a problem for women, it's a problem for all of us to solve. I mean, to be quite honest, it's, you know, it's not about gender, it's about access, education, but, you know, hire correctly, hire females, you know, be creative in terms of the opportunity you're giving to the folks you're hiring, right? So I run a company, we have about 200 people around the world, and, you know, my big point of view is opportunity. I don't care if you don't have the right skill set, if you don't come from a, you know, a certain kind of school, but you give that opportunity. And in our situation, we give it to primarily, you know, primarily to uh, a lot of folks who never had that opportunity, right? So we hire people in Iran, in Pakistan, female, male, trans, LGBT, LGBTQ plus A, every part of the rainbow. We don't care. We have to give that opportunity and take that risk as a CEO. And I think that's the big piece. It's upon us with the money, with the jobs to take the risk. And if that doesn't happen, we're never gonna change, right? So you look at the category now, you look at 3.0, who is representing us? The idiots at FTX and Binance. They are all over the news, and I literally cringe. And I was telling these ladies, I was like, if Ginger and Jen were the CEO of those two companies, that would not be an issue. Both companies would be worth a trillion dollars. Instead, it's like, 
Instead, you see these two idiots fighting on, Nash, on international news, and it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for my gender, it's embarrassing for my category, and uh, that's all I'm gonna say about it. But again, it's opportunity, it's hiring. And I also wanna give a little bit of props to Ginger. We've worked together for a couple of years. And part of my you know, conversation is opportunity. Ginger goes out of her way to introduce me to folks that don't make any sense in terms of a role or a skill set. I end up hiring them because she identifies skill. And because they're female, uh, they come creative. You know, they could be, they're a babysitter. I couldn't care less. And she's introduced me. Someone's like, oh my god, this person needs an opportunity. But yet, they're a teacher. Would you take a look at them? The best people I've hired, and some are sitting at that table over there, have come through that kind of channel, and so I give a lot of props to people like Ginger who give that opportunity that doesn't really exist. They're not only fighting on the news, they're fighting on Twitter. We don't know what's going on. They're fighting in the court of law, yeah, wherever that the I general counsels know. are. <laughs> Marta, uh, we're, we're talking about these big brands, right? You're the president of the Filecoin Foundation. You play an integral role at Protocol Labs. When we look at the brand, the big names in this space, how do we achieve this inclusivity that we're talking about? How do we ensure that everyone is intentional about inclusion and diversity? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I think first, uh, you know, I think as folks on the panel have already said, um, it's really important to note that really the fundamental ethos behind Web3 um, and behind this idea of the next generation of the internet um, is this idea of uh, everyone being uh, equal and uh, giving opportunities to literally anyone anywhere in the world. Um, so how does that actually play out? I mean, that's that's a a nice thing to say, but the way it actually plays out is in a couple of ways. So first of all, um, one of the very cool things about this technology is it enables you to write computer programs for your money, right? So you can transfer money upon a condition being met. So one example would be you could say, for every second of a song that I play on my computer, automatically transfer one one millionth of a cent to the songwriter and one one millionth of a cent to the singer. And that can all happen instantly and automatically across borders, even in micro, micro, micro amounts with no intermediary in between. And so being able to remove those intermediaries and to make transactions directly um, is actually, I think, very radically inclusive. And so when you're thinking about things like these microloan programs as one fantastic example, but also all sorts of other work that potentially can be monetized in a way that it just couldn't be monetized before. Um, so doing things like saying, if you write a blog post, um, every time I click on it, I'm gonna automatically transfer one one millionth of a cent to you, right? And people who write popular blog posts can uh, make money that way. It really opens up capital um, that otherwise would not be open, and it opens it up to literally anyone. Um, and the opportunities there are programmatic. Um, it's not that someone's hiring someone based on a resume, it's that someone does a job and automatically gets paid for it. And so I think Web3 is fundamentally radically inclusive. It makes it completely blind. I love that. Like, I, I, it's the first time I've heard someone put it that way, and I, it's, it just makes sense. It's technology that allows us to be blind. I think that is phenomenal. To be able to say that, to be a community, to, say, to move forward, and to say technology actually made the world blind to any gender bias, to any you know, diversity and inclusion, I think it's fantastic. It's a really good point. I'm stealing it. <laughs> <laughs> for, for anyone in this room who wants to learn more, there's a great book called The Age of Cryptocurrency written by Michael Casey. He's the chief content officer at Coindesk. And the book starts off telling the story of a woman who lives in this, uh, in, under an oppressive regime, the area of the world where she lives, women are not allowed to work. And if they do work, that the money that they make has to go either to their father or the eldest male in their, in their family. This particular woman, um, that the story starts with was able to work, get paid in Bitcoin, and escape um, a, an abusive situation. And when I heard Wendy yesterday at our dinner talking about why Web3 is so important to her and, and why empowering women is so important to her, and she told the story about that 72-year-old woman in Honduras, I thought, wow, we finally have a technology that can help women who are living in these situations that many of us in this room 
cannot really truly understand, get out of. Jen, I want I wanted you to um, kind of tell me about how you think about um, Web3, not just here in North America, but, but as it pertains to women all around the world. God, that feels really broad. Uh, <laughs> Well, some of the things that we were talking about, obviously, is it's all of our responsibility, especially a lot of people in here with money and access, to promote that money and access, and also to support educational initiatives. I mean, that that is the key. We actually uh, brought a few women here who are you know outstanding and, and shining in their incubator programs in their high schools. But then, how can we actually support incubator programs everywhere, or support that education, or democratize it? So that is really that, that piece of opening it up because otherwise you end up with the bro culture that, that really we've been seeing on display everywhere. So, I think access to education is important and Ginger, I want to hand it, hand it off to you because the education is out there. I think when we talk about making education accessible, it comes down to language, how it's presented, how are we talking to people, are we using words that make people lock, feel locked out of a system. Uh, tell me about when, when you were, I guess, going through your education years ago in this space. Has it changed or do we have more work to do? Oh, uh, you know, when I started, um, my background's actually in social work, so I walked into a, a, my first um, job interview and they asked me, do you know the internet? And oftentimes as women, you know, we need to know 110% more before we even apply to something because we, you know, we're, we're perfectionist in many ways, right? And, um, and so that was a moment in my life where I, I stood there um, and I looked and I'm like, yes, absolutely. And then I spent the next week learning as much as possible. And then I showed up for that job interview and I got it and, um, and the rest is history. And I've been building um, businesses for the last 50, 20 years in the tech space, not knowing a single thing about tech. And I think one of the things that we do uh, at Upflex is we've built a company that's 100% distributed, which enables us to hire people everywhere. Um, most of our team is in tier two, tier three cities where these individuals never could compete for some of these roles. And I think as companies now understand that you don't have to have physical proximity and have people going into offices, this allows us to hire women and provide internship programs globally. Um, in our organization, uh, most of our people come from, we have people in over 16 countries, um, and we, you know, it's wonderful because we intentionally built the company with diversity in mind. And as David said, it's not about the skills that you have, it's the attitude that you bring to the, to the opportunity. So, um, you know, never think that you need to know so much to even have that opportunity. Be willing to say, I'm willing to learn and, and participate and look for, I think as employers, we have to frame our job so that we're, we're being inclusive. Um, there's this study uh, with Zurich um, and they were looking at the hiring practices and they were looking at the number of resumes that were submitted um, using words like job sharing, remote access, um, um, and flexibility um, in the job um, postings themselves increases the likelihood of women participating in those opportunities. So. Are, are also looking at how many things you put in that recommended list, because to your earlier point, many women feel they have to check every single box. So can you, can you talk more about the type of person you're looking for, the type of initiative, the type of mind that you're looking for versus did they go to this school and you know, have they done this and run this? And it, because then you start to limit that field and make people feel that they can't apply for these things or they don't qualify. I mean, people also forget 3.0, it's mostly theory, so you have to be really creative. And I've yeah. come to learn <laughs> on my team, which is primarily, I actually had no idea about this stat uh, until I started doing some research uh, of our own company. I'm the only senior manager of a 10-person leadership team. I was like, stunned by that. And apparently, someone on my table told me, they're like, we're 80% women. I was like, really? It's because in marketing, we're the dumb kids of the room. We have to be creative, right? 3.0, while it's a technology that is sound, you have to be creative. You have to work on instinct. And these are just 
you know, skill sets that you can't teach in school. You can't learn that on the job. It comes instinctually. And I think a lot of the, you know, of our hires who happen to just be female are much more creative. They could think outside the box. You know, a metaverse. It's a fake world, you know, and like you're literally creating a fake universe. That, that open, chaotic aspect. Exactly, yeah. and therefore men screw it up. They go play video games, they fight, they, you know, they make their avatars like, you know, to Hugh Hefner, whereas, you know, I've noticed the metaverses that are successful, the NFTs that seem to be, you know, a real use case, come from the creativity of women, women of the world, art, um, certain, you know, utilities that blockchain is used for, it is driven by women founders, which I really respect, and I think while education is key, to your point, I think hiring, you have to hire creativity, you have to hire you know, blindly, and ultimately um, give people a chance. You know, I make fun of my team. Um, I hire people from college. I was like, quit school, it's fine. Uh, sorry, Q. Uh, you know, I had a kid, you know, I have someone who said, you know, he goes to Columbia, and I'm literally telling him to quit school to work full time, because education to me, while important, you know, again, his mom's gonna kill me, uh, while important, <laughs> What is more important in our category, it is creativity, it is a metaverse, take a risk. There's a lot of money in this room. I highly suggest do not look at schools, do not look at you know, the background, hire on instinct and hire on creativity is the one advice I could give you. And the other half, folks who are you know, here learning and going into the industry, you are on equal footing. Exactly. 3.0, it is literally like Why this open? view. It is limitless, and so just go for it, and you are on equal footing with men. Just to add to David's, um, you know, uh, what he was talking about, one of the hardest things is starting your own business and, and getting the funding. And the people that are funding and investing in this are now waking up to the fact that, you know, when you have women-led businesses, they are actually more profitable. Um, and so the investment dollars are still not there, uh, unfortunately, but there's more women who have successfully built their own businesses and are now reinvesting in women. Which is and it's phenomenal. so important to hear about all those women because it's also representation and, and for women to see other women and for even men to see women as capable and powerful. And so covering, you know, there's plenty of women that run, you know, shows and that, that speak and there's all these marketers here probably. Make sure there's that inclusivity so that when people hear words like CEO, they don't automatically think of a male. Marta, I'd love to get you your perspective um, here, and I would love to tack on to that. You know, there's a lot of young women in the room here. What advice would you give them? We're saying a lot of things. What tactical advice would you give them to break into this industry? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my tactical advice for women um, and, and for everyone who's interested in these types of technologies and other emerging technologies um, is to find a niche and then to find a niche within the niche, um, preferably at the very cutting edge of, of what um, is going on in technology. Um, so, you know, one of the things, if you want to be, let's say, like a patent lawyer, there are thousands of people who've been doing that for 40 years, and you're never gonna be at the top of that field without putting in the 40 years of experience. And the thing that's amazing about these new, extremely cutting edge technologies is that um, you can come in with a few years of experience and um, really, you know, there's, there, for example, with blockchain technology, when I started doing blockchain technology as a blockchain lawyer in 2015, there were a handful of blockchain lawyers, period, end stop. Um, and so today, being someone with with seven years of blockchain law experience, um, let me tell you, there's no one with 40 years of blockchain law experience because blockchain didn't exist 40 years ago or even uh, even 15 years ago. And so what I would say is find the thing that is the, the most new, the most cutting edge, find a niche within it and find a niche within that. Um, and really, that's a, a really great way to position yourself as and to in fact become an expert in an area where others are not going to um, have already uh, uh, sort of blazed the trail. Jen, I want you to jump in here. Um, so that's advice for people who want to break into Web3. Let's say we're already working in a tech role and we want to transition that tech role over to one in Web3. What advice would you give? Have confidence in yourself. You know, you can do it. Obviously, as we've all heard today, it's very wide open. It's not fully defined and you don't have to know everything. And so jumping in now 
gives you that opportunity. There's a ton of great content online, educational information, YouTube videos, just putting a little bit of effort in, you can learn a tremendous amount. And then hopefully you've been taking pictures or you take opportunities to meet all these amazing women here uh, or contact them uh, at their contacts uh, that have been listed on these screens. Hopefully also simulcast for everyone out there. And and reach out to them because you know they these are the, the women that really are gonna power this and run it. And you can connect with them and have that advocate we have 11 seconds left. I'm going to get in so much trouble. Ginger, quickly. Oh, you know, uh, I'm going to say forget the tech, figure out the purpose. I think uh, oftentimes we get caught up in the tech, and it's not the tech. We're solving problems. Find the biggest problem you want to solve and go f figure it out in terms of what that means to the individuals, the communities that you're supporting, and use the technology as an enablement, but it is not the focus of what you should be thinking about. It's the purpose. 100%. <laughs> All right, thank you so much to my panelists. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions for any of the panelists, I'm sure you'll find them. Bye-bye. <laughs>